Last week, we looked at God's sovereignty, the timing of all affairs of human history according to God's perfect plan. We learned that everything is beautiful in His time. We learned about how we ought to feel about God's sovereign, beautiful orchestration over all events. This morning, we're going to look again at God's beautiful, meticulous orchestration of every event of life. But we're going to ask the question, how should we live under it? I don't know if you've ever asked the sort of philosophical, theological question, is, if God is sovereign, why should I, fill in the blank, do anything at all? This is a question that Solomon is not only comfortable with, but will give us great detail. In fact, a large section of the book of Ecclesiastes, beginning here and following in the next few chapters, is instruction and details about how to live life under the governance of God. How to live life in a world where God is sovereign and the world is broken. How to live under the complexities of life, under the hand of a good God who is in control of all things. Solomon does not espouse a view of the sovereignty of God in which humans are inactive or unaccountable, somehow robotic or fatalistic. Now, Solomon's theology here is very biblical. God is in charge and men are responsible for how they live. He's going to give us some instructions this morning on how to live life in view of the sovereign orchestration of every event in the universe. Let me read for us Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Verses 12 to 22. Solomon writes, I know that there is nothing better for them than to rejoice and to do good in one's lifetime. Moreover, that every man who eats and drinks sees good in all his labor. It is the gift of God. I know that everything God does will remain forever. There is nothing to add to it and there is nothing to take from it. For God has so worked that men should fear him. That which is has been already, and that which will be has already been, for God seeks what has passed by. Furthermore, I have seen under the sun that in the place of justice there is wickedness, and in the place of righteousness there is wickedness. I said to myself, God will judge both the righteous man and the wicked man, for a time for every matter and for every deed is there. I said to myself, concerning the sons of men, God has surely tested them in order for them to see that they are but beasts. For the fate of the sons of men and the fate of beasts is the same. As one dies, so dies the other. Indeed, they all have the same breath, and there is no advantage for man over beast, for all is vanity. All go to the same place. All came from the dust, and all return to the dust." Who knows that the breath of man ascends upward and the breath of beast descends downward to the earth? I have seen that nothing is better than that man should be happy in his activities, for that is his lot. For who will bring him to see what will occur after him? Let's pray together. God, we come to your word. And we need to hear from you, for we live in a perplexing world. We live in a world that is not all as it should be. And when we don't understand, oh God, we must look to you to hear a word from you, to have our hearts settled, to have our lives directed. God, we are but finite creatures with limited knowledge, with limited abilities. And more than that, we are corrupted from the very inside, from our very nature. We don't see things as we ought. And so we come as dependent creatures who come to hear from you because your words are our very food. Your words are lights to our feet and lamps into our paths. We come to be like trees firmly planted by streams of water. God, we must hear from you if we are to live aright. right. 
So we ask by the power of your Holy Spirit this morning that you would give a hearing to your word, that your word would have its place in our hearts and lives, that it would govern our behavior, but more than anything, that your word would point us to you, our hope, our joy, our satisfaction, our maker. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. How do we live in God's world? With God directing all things, meticulously orchestrating all events of life, how are we to live? There are some difficult statements in this portion of your Bible. I don't know if you've read this before, come across these things. It's important for us to trace the author's aim in this section. This section of Scripture is a portion of a sermon that the, the King Solomon is preaching to his own people, to his own heart, to his kids, to us. And we need to hear the whole thing. In fact, tracing the author's intent will be so helpful. It would be easy to take a verse or a phrase from this portion of our scripture and misunderstand the author's intent. I think we need to have a settled conviction that we follow Solomon all the way to the end, to the conclusion of this sermon where he is so desperately driving us. And we'll see some hints of that in our passage this morning. And you know, you and I should expect complex statements, complex statements from a book which purports to explain all of life to us because we live in a complex world. Things are not simple here. We live in a perplexing world where the events that surround us and the things that we encounter, the the mix of joy and pain is perplexing. It's not surprising that we would find some of the things written here that we do. We are fallen creatures in a fallen world. And last week, we looked at ourselves as ants on a grand canvas who can't back up enough to see the whole picture, tripping and stumbling over brush strokes, not able to take in the whole masterpiece. And we have an implanted desire to figure it all out, but we don't have the resources, the capacity to see it all. And so we walk through this life without the big picture. We walk through this life or the milieu of colors and textures that paint the whole. Solomon understands our predicament. He doesn't claim to understand it himself, but he proceeds from his exposition of the sovereignty of God in the first 11 verses of this chapter to a practical exhortation on how we should respond. The first exhortation he gives to us is simply this. Rejoice in the God who gives. Rejoice in the God who gives. We find this in verses 12 and 13. Solomon says, I know that there is nothing better for them than to rejoice and to do good in one's lifetime. Moreover, that every man who eats and drinks sees good in all his labor. It is the gift of God. Solomon here is not throwing his hands up in some sort of existentialist hedonism. What he presents here is intentional, theological enjoyment. In fact, he's going to build on this theology of delight throughout the book of Ecclesiastes. It's one of the dominant themes. How are we to actually enjoy the things that God gives as gifts in this life? And more details are to follow as Solomon unfolds that theme. Here, he begins to unfold it. And Solomon previously has told us that there is nothing good in a man... In a fallen world, in a fallen condition, there is nothing inherent in man that is good that he could find enjoyment under the sun. And yet here, something from outside of man, something alien to man's nature, invades the scene. Something has changed. In Ecclesiastes 2, things like eating and drinking and laboring hard were a vexation to Solomon, a striving after the wind. Vanity, hevel, emptiness. You try to grasp after something like the steam off the top of a cup of coffee, and before you get your hands around it, it's gone. You think there's something to be had in the things under the sun, and you try to go after and get them, and it just isn't there. And so you have to try something else and try something else. And Solomon went on his experiment trying to find the meaning of life in the things under the sun. And all of those things left him empty. But now, some of those very same elements, eating a great meal, delighting in the fruits of your labor, these are now 
stated positively. They become a cause for joy. What has changed? Solomon's perspective here has lifted from a mere horizontal, under-the-sun viewpoint to a perspective that begins with God. And this is a hint toward what Solomon is driving at in the whole of his sermon. Ecclesiastes 12, 13, he says, The conclusion, when all has been heard, is this. Fear God and keep His commandments. This applies to every person. That's where Solomon wants to drive us toward, to a right relationship to our Creator. I want you to think about what a right relationship to the maker of all things does to our relationship with the things he has made. A Christian can experience a great meal in a way that a non-Christian does not have the capacity at all to do. You think about it, you sit down at a wonderful meal and, and all of the elements of this delightful experience are before you and you eat You taste, you enjoy, a smile comes to your face, and the Christian says something like, boy, this meal was great. Sure, it's a dim foretaste of what is to come in eternity. I I read Isaiah 25, and, and there's a great banquet that God is preparing on this mountain for all peoples when he takes away the curse of death and he removes every tear from their eyes, and he's spreading a lavish banquet of the best foods ever then. <laughs> this little appetizer that I just had, that was great. It preminds me of what is to come. What awaits me when I get home? And if the Christian never has another meal like this on this side of eternity, nothing's lost. But the foretaste of infinite gain has been had. That is not a white-knuckle grip on a great meal. That is an open-handed reception of a sweet and kind gift from our Maker. It serves its intended purpose. It taps into our capacity for enjoyment and points us to the true source. That's how a Christian enjoys a good meal. An unbeliever, a non-Christian, tasting the same food, might say, that was the best meal I've ever had. When can I get another? And another. And I need something better. The the, the best thing I ever had doesn't satisfy anymore. I need another kind of meal. And and when food fails to satisfy, something else, and something else, and and something else, and, and the unbeliever is forever on a futile chase to find ultimate things in created things. It's the difference between someone who lives for life under the sun and one who lives for the glory of God while under the sun. You've heard of those who worship their work versus those who worship at work. Fundamental difference between those who are rightly related to their maker and those who are not. Satisfaction, if your satisfaction terminates in the food or the drink or the job, you will forever be chasing what you cannot get. If, however, your satisfaction terminates in the giver of all good things, everything changes Those gifts become a foretaste rather than a vanity. If your joy terminates in the giver of all good things, a world of delights opens up to you as appetizers and pre-minders of the joy that is to come. This is what Solomon is getting at when he says, there's nothing better for them to rejoice, be happy, take joy, to do good in one's lifetime. And that every man who eats and drinks sees good in all his labor, it is the gift of God. And notice how God's gift and man's labor coincide there to produce delightful things. Right? If you don't work hard, you're not going to get a great meal. But if you work hard and God sees fit to withhold true joy from it, you'll never have true joy even in it. The labor of man and the gift of God, the kindness of God, we might say the grace of God dispensed freely to those who don't deserve it, work to showing us what joy is 
It's located first and foremost in him. That is the direction Solomon is driving this entire sermon. You cannot enjoy life until you choose to enjoy God. There's a second instruction here. It's in verses 14 and 15. It is simply this. Revere the God who is in charge. Revere the God who is in charge. Solomon reminds us here of God's sovereignty. He says, I know that everything God does will remain forever. There's nothing to add to it. There's nothing to take from it. For God has so worked that men should fear him. Do you hear the point? God's sovereignty ought to drive us to fear God. Which again is driving at Solomon's conclusion. The end of all of it is fear God and keep his commandments. He begins with this statement about God's sovereignty that God's plan is permanent, perfect, and purposeful. It's permanent. He says, I know that whatever God does will remain forever. This is like what the rest of the Bible says, Proverbs 19.21, Many plans are in man's heart, but the counsel of the Lord will stand. Psalm 33.11, The counsel of the Lord stands forever, the plans of his heart from generation to generation. And God's sovereign orchestration of events is not only permanent, it is also perfect. Solomon says there's nothing to add to it and there is nothing to take away from it. Now, if you're like me, you've been tempted to ask the question, wait a second, maybe, maybe I could take away from what God's doing right now. I, I don't particularly like what God has sovereignly brought into my life. I think there's a better plan or... Maybe God's plan could be improved if he just added this to my life or that to my life. And perhaps you've been tempted to think those thoughts, to think that God's plan could be improved upon. And hopefully you've thought about it long enough to answer in the negative. For when you've seen God's faithfulness, when you've seen the panoply of attributes of God's character shine through in what he sovereignly orchestrates in your life, when you look back in the rearview mirror, and hindsight is a little better. And you see, my God has been good and faithful in everything that he's brought into my life. You and I know personally that we would never want to alter God's good and perfect plan. It comes from an omniscient mind. It comes from a perfect character. It comes from a flawless purpose. And you and I would be foolish to think we could improve upon it. Solomon says no one could. God's plan is permanent, perfect, and purposeful. The purpose is in verse, verse 14. God has so worked that men should fear him. The point of God's sovereignty explained here is that we would fear God. Simply put, God is God, and I am not. That's really good news. Sovereignty is but one of God's many attributes, but it fundamentally sets him apart from every created thing. And God's stated purpose here for explaining his sovereignty or for putting it on display is that we would fear him. The point of his orchestration of the events of time is, is that we would fear him. How often do you think of that? Think about the number of times you check your watch or check your phone throughout the day. You see those little numbers. I'm looking at the clock and wondering, how much time do I have left in this sermon Every time we look at the clock, are we thinking, I should fear God. He's in charge of all of those moments. Every tick of the clock, every second that goes by. And that exists so that I would recognize that he is in charge of all of them. Let me be small again. Some have wanted to ameliorate the idea of the fear of God. Right? We understand that God loves his own, and that perfect love casts out fear. There is a certain kind of fear that God's love for his children completely and totally eradicates. The fear of condemnation, fear of wrath, etc. But there's a kind of fear which will never be a done away with, and it is the right and abject fear of a creature before his maker. Even terror is an appropriate word. The English word terrific uh, used to come from that idea of terror. God is terrific. Yes, he is. Even for the best of us. Listen to Isaiah, who in his day, we might have said, this is the most righteous guy around. 
And Isaiah, when he comes into the presence of a holy God, he is exposed. He cries out, Woe is me, curses upon me, for I am ruined. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Peter saw a miracle of Jesus and knew, caught a glimpse all of a sudden, that this one with him was no one to be trifled with. Peter's response was to fall down at Jesus' feet saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. The writer of Hebrews says, We offer to God an acceptable sacrifice with reverence and awe. And Solomon's conclusion to his entire sermon is that we would fear him. That's an Old Testament way of coming into a right relationship with your creator. This goes against the grain of the way we tend naturally to want to think about God. But make no mistake, our God is in the heavens and he does whatever he pleases. And that ought to make us feel small, frail. Solomon reinforces the purposeful, meticulous orchestration of history in verse 15. He says, that which is has been already, and that which will be has already been, for God seeks what has passed by. Literally, God seeks what hurries along, what is scurrying on into the past. This is a way for Solomon to say there's nothing new under the sun, except not from man's perspective, but from God's perspective. You see, God's orchestration of human events in human history, in one sense, has not changed. He has the same old situation with the same old purpose, which is to bring us to frustration in life in a broken world and drive us to himself. God's plan for us is on repeat. How many times will you go through life experimenting Solomon's failed experiment and try it again and try it again, yielding the same results? God has frustrated the created order, has sovereignly orchestrated things so that this world will not yield ultimate satisfaction. And this lesson for us is on repeat, to humble us, How many times will we miss it? It'll come around again for a time until time runs out. That leads us to another perspective by which we need to live in verses 16 and 17. Remember that God will judge. Remember that God will judge. Verse 16, Solomon says, Furthermore, I have seen under the sun that in the place of justice there is wickedness. And in the place of righteousness there is wickedness. Injustice in the world around us has given thoughtful people cause to protest. A protest takes many forms, but sometimes it goes like this. How could God be sovereign if there is injustice in the world? Or maybe How can God be good if there is injustice in the world? He might be in control, but he certainly can't be good. Or maybe it goes a step further in protest. Given the injustice in this world, God doesn't exist. Have you heard these? And notice how Solomon paints this. In the place of justice, there is wickedness. What he means there is in the place where justice is supposed to be highlighted, I find wickedness. He's talking here about the courtroom. And he goes on and says, in the place of righteousness there is wickedness. And and maybe he has in view the temple. Wickedness in the two places that we expect to be better. At the temple, or, or in our day we might say at church, And in the courtroom, we expect something of a safe haven from human corruption. We should at least get justice there. If it's to be found anywhere, let it be in the courtrooms. Let it be in houses of worship. And the problem with that thinking is that people are in the courtrooms. People are in houses of worship. Of course wickedness is there. Of course injustice is there. Injustice is everywhere. 
And it's not eradicated just because someone wears a black robe or a clerical collar. And what do we find in a courtroom populated by people? Cooked books, tampered evidence, crooked investigators, unscrupulous lawyers, biased juries, bribed judges, or in the best of courts, people with finite understanding and limited knowledge who can't penetrate the hearts of men and sort out motives. Innocent people get convicted and punished. Guilty people go free. It's unfair. And the unfairness is frustrating for those who have to live under it. You may have seen the statue of Lady Justice. She's blindfolded. She holds scales in one hand and a sword in the other. These are emblems of impartiality and fairness and effect. The blindfold means she's not supposed to be biased, not supposed to be prejudicial. She's supposed to be blind and passionless, indifferent, and just mete out pure justice. The scales indicate that there is supposed to be fairness and balance. And the sword is indicative of the punishment that comes with a violation of justice. So justice can be effective. But human judges and juries have their eyes open. They make assessments through the lenses of their own biases and their own experiences, their own desires. Human judges and juries carry imbalanced scales, often weighted in favor of the privileged or the well-connected, the wicked and the powerful. Human judges and juries often have drawn the sword of so-called justice against the innocent and the vulnerable. You and I are unjust members of an unjust race longing for the world around us to do what is right. All the while, we are unable to do what is right in our own spheres of influence or to affect it even in our own lives and hearts. The best of human judges are still finite, and they can't possibly get every case right, even when lives hang in the balance. Have you ever thought to yourself, if I had the keys to the world, I would solve all the injustices guess what? Solomon had the keys. And here he is complaining about the injustice. Wait, isn't he king? I mean, Solomon, don't write Ecclesiastes and complain about injustice. You're the king. Solve it. Fix it. If you can see the problem so well, eradicate injustice. And he couldn't. Listen to Solomon's words in 2 Chronicles 19. He says to the judges, the judges that worked under him to bring about justice in the land, consider what you are doing, for you do not judge for man, but for the Lord who is with you when you render judgment. Now then, let the fear of the Lord be upon you, and be very careful what you do, for the Lord our God will have no part in unrighteousness or partiality or the taking of a bribe. That's the message from the king to the judges over the courts in the land couldn't solve it. As some have said that these words here are proof that Solomon did not write this book. <laughs> I think this is a frank admission that even with the best intentions, the best of men will get it wrong. Even with all of the power available at the disposal of a sovereign in a land, he couldn't fix it. And if we think we can solve the fundamental problem of injustice under the sun, we misunderstand the human predicament and the curse of God. How do we respond as humans to the injustices around us? Frustration. Some give up. Some resort to anarchy. And we should look up. Solomon is not telling us in this sermon how to establish justice for our world in our time. In this sermon, he is driving us very purposefully to long for another world and another time. Jesus echoed this desire, Matthew 5, 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, rightness, for they will be satisfied. Look at verse 17. Here is the eschatological correction to the injustice of our world. 
I said to myself, God will judge both the righteous man and the wicked man. For a time for every matter and for every deed is there. Where? That little there at the end of the sentence just kind of hangs in English. It hangs in Hebrew too. Much debate about where's the there. I think it's not supposed to be specified. (laughs) Just simply there is a time coming that God has established for judgment. And Solomon may have in view a, a temporal act of justice. He may have eternal justice in view. Certainly eternal is the final. Sometimes God brings about a temporal rectification. In World War II in Nazi Germany, the Nazis had set up what they called the People's Court. Okay, don't think Judge Wapner. Okay, this was wicked. In fact, in the history of human courts of law, there probably is no worse travesty of justice than this. The man who ran it was a man named Ronald Freisler. And he set himself up as judge, jury, advocate, prosecutor, executioner, everything. There was no defense. Nobody could speak up for themselves. His speeches were haranguing monologues about the enemies of the Nazi regime and how they deserved to die. They fabricate all kinds of things or tell the truth about them and then have them killed. It was February 3rd, 1945 when the U.S. 8th Air Force sent a thousand bombers over Berlin and dropped bombs. A bomb hit the people's court. Eric Metaxas records this event. I love the way he phrases this. There's just no better way to say this in his biography of um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He says, The supremely wicked Freisler was brained by a ceiling beam and was dispatched to another bar of justice altogether. An unscheduled appearance in that other court, one with which he seemed to have been less well acquainted. And I would add one for which he was utterly unprepared. God can take care of justice temporally. Sometimes men try to take care of justice temporally. And men have responsibilities to do their best at doing what is just and right. There was a Supreme Court case in 2005, Kello versus New London, where the Supreme Court ruled in favor of a doctrine of eminent domain. That is, a local government could condemn privately owned property, confiscate it, keep it for itself in order to allow a commercial developer to take over the property. And the reason was the commercial developer would develop more tax revenue for the local government than the private owner who held it before. You see, it's, it's better for the public interest if I take your farm and we put a shopping mall up because the shopping mall will produce more revenue for the city. And the Supreme Court, in a 5-4 decision, ruled in favor of that eminent domain ruling. Justice David Souter, who sided with the majority decision in the case, happened to own some property in Weir, New Hampshire. Local residents in Weir, New Hampshire, who valued their own property rights, decided to take things into their own hands. Under the ruling that Souter had been a part of at the Supreme Court level, they decided to pass around a little notice, get enough signatures. All they needed was 25 signatures to put it on a local ballot to take over Souter's farm and turn it into a hotel that they called the Loss of Liberty Inn. (laughs) And they were going to welcome people to come in and go to this hotel as a monument to the travesty of justice executed at the U.S. Supreme Court level. The motion was amended during the vote, and and hence the property was not taken and the hotel was never built. But men tried to exact some sort of justice. Far more complete, far more consequential, and far more terrifying than any earthly rendering of justice will be God's final arbitration at the end of time. Do you think about that moment? I try my best to meditate on this reality a little bit every day. Psalm 75, 2. God says, when I select an appointed time, it is I who judge with equity. 
Psalm 9.8. He will judge the world in righteousness. He will execute judgment for the peoples with equity. Acts 17.31, God has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. And I'll read two verses from the scene of that great white throne judgment detailed in Revelation chapter 20. Where every human being who has not been purchased by the blood of the Lamb will stand before God on that great and final day and give an account for all they've thought all they've said, all they've done. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat upon it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books, according to their deeds. My friends, the injustices that you and I face here, we face temporarily. But there is a coming, eternal, unquenchable vindication of wrongs that if we could only but catch a glimpse of it now, I'm convinced we'd spend a lot more time praying for our enemies, pleading with them to repent, having compassion on those who wrong us, seeking to be ambassadors of peace, longing to go between God's enemies and God and proclaim the gospel of life to them. Listen to Peter's description of Jesus' response to injustice. Jesus was the one who suffered more injustice than any sinner will ever know. Peter says, he committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. How are you and I to respond to the injustices around us? I think we ought to long for justice. We ought to recognize that something is not right in our world. To pray for justice, even to work for just things, to work for that which is just and right in our own spheres of influence. Holding hands with that praying and longing and working ought to be a recognition of our own limitations. When you're up against the injustices of the world, recognize you're up against human depravity. You're up against the curse of God, Ecclesiastes 7, who can straighten what he himself has bent. And you're up against your own finitude. You and I are not great assessors of what is justice or what is injustice. Why? (laughs) Because of our own fallenness, our own finiteness, our own fallibility. All of the fallenness and fallibility that's out there that we criticize, it's in here too. There's a waiting to be done. A waiting with a settled conviction that God will. He will vindicate his name. He will adjudicate rightly. He will set everything correct. And he will do it in his time. We ought to pray, thy kingdom come. We dare not ignore the injustice around us. But we mustn't be deceived into thinking that our task on this earth is to eradicate it either. The presence of injustice in our fallen world is providential. It is an opportunity for us who know the only one who is just. Eric described him this morning as the just and the justifier of those who believe. The one who is absolutely righteous is willing to declare righteous all of those who place their faith in Jesus Christ, who died in our place to pay for sins, to pay for our sins. And we know him who is just. And we can point frustrated people to him in the face of earthly injustices. I know this, friends, this is all a part of his plan. And every frustration under the sun, if we look at it rightly, is a gift. A gift, again, so that we would not enter eternity without God. 
to have a nice, easy, comfortable life here without Jesus, godless, wrapped up in your own temporal pleasures, would be a tragedy as you step out of time and into eternity and face God's unflinching wrath. You and I are to let those discomforts, even the injustices that are around us, to remind us that this isn't home. This is not where we belong. And that there is coming a day when God will set everything everything right. That leads us to another perspective Solomon drives us at in verses 18 to 21. Remember that you will die. Remember that you will die. Again, in the face of the pain of death, you lose someone that you love and you're tempted to cry out, God, how could you be in control if this happens? Or how could you be good if my loved one dies? Or God, you you must not even exist. Injustice and mortality are opportunities for us to challenge the sovereignty and the goodness and existence of God. We ask, why must we wait here under the sun in frustration in a broken and unjust world? Solomon tells us, verse 18, God has surely tested them. This is a test. Not a pass-fail kind of test, but a the, the word literally means here to sift or to winnow, to, to thresh them, to see what they are made of. It reveals the quality and the character of something. Listen, God will judge all things when history has run its course, but God is judging and assessing us even now by the various discrepancies and complexities of life. Let them see what they're made of. And Solomon says we are creatures. Let them see that they are but beasts. And Solomon here draws out the similarities between humans and animals. And you and I are quick to run to Psalm 8 and Genesis 127 that we are of the highest of God's created order and we are created in God's image and we're fundamentally different than the animals. Yes. What Solomon wants to point out here is that we are fundamentally different than God. That we are creatures. He wants to point out what we have in common with animals. We are created, dependent, mortal, subject to God's will, finite, frail, infinitely smaller than God. We are not God. And God comes down and demolishes our towers of Babel that we build for our own glory with mortality. Notice verse 19. For the fate of the sons of men and the fate of beasts is the same. As one dies, so dies the other. Indeed, they all have the same breath, and there is no advantage for man over the beast, for all is vanity. What is the similarity that Solomon is pointing out here? Death and mortality. This is similar to the way God described it in Genesis 7. All flesh that moved upon the earth perished. Birds, cattle, and beasts, every swarming things that swarms upon the earth and all mankind. Of all that was on the dry land, all in whose nostrils was the breath of the spirit of life died. There in Genesis 7, the breath of life in animals and in man used the same way. And Solomon says the destination is the same. It's dust to dust. You're probably thinking that Solomon borrowed this wording from some poem, maybe from Cary Livgren of Kansas, you know, dust in the wind. The same old song, just a drop of water in an endless sea. All all that we do crumbles to the ground, though we refuse to see. Dust in the wind. All we are is dust in the wind. That's not the poem Solomon got this from. He got this from an older poem. A poem written at the very beginning. Genesis 3.19. Here's God's poem to the man after the fall. By the sweat of your face, you will eke bread out of the ground until you return to the ground. Because from it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Mortality levels the pride of humanity. The best, the strongest, the brightest, the most beautiful, they all succumb to weakness, darkness, and decay. And from the observations that you and I could make this side of the grave, the best humans rot just like the carcasses of the animals of the earth. 
And it's not just the writer of Ecclesiastes that makes this claim. If you think this is just a pessimistic perspective that only comes from this book, what's this book doing in my Bible? The psalmist, sons of Korah, said the same thing in Psalm 49. Even wise men die. The stupid and the senseless alike perish. Man in his pomp will not endure. He is like the beasts that perish. And this is proper. That man would die. That animals would die. Romans 5.12 says, Just as through one man sin entered into the world, death entered the world through sin. And so death spread to all men, and as a result, all sinned. This humbles the pride of man, who says they can have my pride when they pry it from my cold, dead fingers, and God will. Look at verse 21. Solomon says, who knows that the breath of man ascends upward and the breath of the beast descends downward to the earth? There's a number of ways to sort of take this. It, it sounds like a question. Uh, you should know that six out of nine times that this construction is used in the Hebrew Old Testament, it's not a question, but, it's a, but a positive affirmation of a truth that's being questioned. Uh, whether we take it as a question here or not, we have to wrestle with this. Does Solomon not know what happens after we die? Is he really asking, who knows where people go? <laughs> uh, we know that's not the case. In Ecclesiastes 12, 7, just a, a few moments later in this same sermon, Solomon says, the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the spirit of man will return to God who gave it. Okay? Solomon is not clueless. He, he's not wallowing in misunderstandings here. He's not scrambling to look for answers that he hasn't yet found. He's driving us somewhere. I think what he's saying in this verse, in verse 21, is that, People do not give a right account of what actually happens to animals and to men after they die. Even if we take it as a question, who is it that knows where animals go and where men go? That men go up and animals go down. Who, who's paying attention to these things? In other words, there are not many who take to heart as they ought to the fact that death separates a physical body from the inner person. And while animals cease to exist, the inner man goes to meet his maker. We have to remember that we die. A last instruction for life under the sovereignty of God is to rejoice in the God who gives. In verse 22, we're back to verse 12. Point five and point number one on your sermon outline this morning are exactly the same. That's where Solomon has brought us full circle to this truth. Look at verse 22. I have seen that nothing is better than that man should be happy in his activities, for that is his lot. For who will bring him to see what will occur after him? Now we must ask, if God is sovereign, if justice is delayed, and if death is coming, how should the one humbled by these things live? We should rejoice in the God who gives. Enjoy life from God's hand. You see, the happiness that Solomon is driving us toward is not a happiness in happiness, a happiness for happiness' sake, but it is centrally a happiness in God. And this eternal perspective liberates our quest for joy from the slavery to vanity and frustration. Only a Christian can experience lasting happiness in his activities because he has fundamentally given up the fruitless search for meaning in the activities themselves. His satisfaction is found in God, and now he's free to receive as a gift the happiness that the activity affords without being caught in the trap, the noose of chasing after an activity as a terminal end to satisfaction. And I love this question Solomon asks at the end. For who will bring him to see what will occur after him? If nobody's paying attention to the fact that they're mortal, who's going to help mankind understand what happens next? And he sort of leaves it hanging here. He'll pick up this theme later on in the book. I don't want to leave it hanging for us this morning. I want to tell you exactly who will bring us to see what will occur afterwards. Listen to the words of 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. God has saved us, 
and has called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and his grace which was granted to us in Christ Jesus from all eternity, but has now been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. What Old Testament writers could catch glimpses of, Job knew that his Redeemer lived and he would see him. David wrote and spoke and sung about eternal life. The Old Testament saints were saints who believed in a better land, in a home, in a resurrection. But they didn't see nearly as clearly as we do. For God himself has come in the flesh and has brought to life immortality and eternal life through the gospel. The good news that through his death, burial, and resurrection, the one who believes in him can have life can have hope, can have joy, can have God himself, and a guarantee, or a guarantee that the giver of all good things is now your father, is now the one who promises pleasures at his right hand forevermore, joy in his very presence. Paul was a New Testament saint, who wrote about a kind of joy, a kind of contentment in adverse circumstances that we probably have a hard time understanding. Paul writes in Philippians 4.11, Not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. Where was Paul when he wrote those words? He was in jail. He was in prison. His life was on the line. He was, in fact, the victim of injustice. He was aware of his own mortality. (laughs) He would eventually be executed. And yet he writes a book about joy (laughs) from prison, encouraging other believers, commanding other believers to have joy like he has joy. In the passage just before these words, he had written about his citizenship in heaven. You see, Paul was a faithful ambassador of another realm. In the coming weeks in the book of Ecclesiastes, we'll look at more complexities of life in a broken, cursed, blessed, sad, happy world. You have to understand that life under the sun is a mixed bag. But if you are rightly related to your maker then you have access and capacity for joy unavailable to the world around us. And you have an eternity of joy in his presence to anticipate. Let's pray. Oh God, your sovereignty, your meticulous care of every detail of time and space, such a comfort to us who love you. I know this morning that the the idea that you would be in charge of all the events of history would, would actually be a threat to someone who wants to be in charge, someone who wants to live their life as the captain of their soul. God, I pray that you would bring to brokenness such a one who may be here this morning. Draw them to yourself and let them see that a surrender to you is a surrender to infinite joy. Giving up on an emptiness and a futility and a frustration that is life under a cursed and broken world is the beginning of real life. God, we pray that you would bring about real life this morning in the hearts of those who need it. God, you are the fount of every blessing. And it is to you now that we sing in Jesus' name.